What is up, After Hours Entrepreneur? Today we're talking with Josh Hall. Josh Hall is a web design expert and he actually built his freelancing business into a six-figure business over the course of the last 10 years. This is a really, really informative episode. Not only are we talking about the journeys and the challenge of entrepreneurship, we're gonna be talking about how podcasting has really improved the way that he brings in leads and the way that he connects with his audience. But we're gonna spend about the last half hour, this is a longer episode today, we're spending about the last half hour talking web design. We're gonna be talking about some of the choices that Josh has made with his web design. We're gonna talk about some of the choices that I've made with my web design. He's gonna rip me apart basically and tell me all the things that I'm doing wrong, which you definitely wanna stick around for. And if you are listening to the After Hours Entrepreneur, you might wanna head over to YouTube. This episode is going to be fire on YouTube. I think we do a really good job for all the podcast listeners. You're going to have an awesome, awesome experience in this episode. You're going to walk away with a lot of great ways to improve the quality of your website, whether it's your colors, whether it's the tree trunk principle, whether it's some tips for your footers, whether it's your about page, there's a lot of really good stuff here. So listen up, pay attention. If you haven't yet hit the subscribe button. Now is the time to hit subscribe. Let's get into the episode. All right, After Hours Entrepreneurs, we're in for a banger. We are joined by Josh Hall, web design expert extraordinaire. He's been doing it for over a decade. And one of the things I love about Josh is he's truly an After Hours Entrepreneur because he started part-time. He scaled this into a six-figure business, been doing it for over a decade. Thrilled to talk shop. Josh, how are we doing? I'm doing awesome, Mark. Thanks for having me on, man. I love entrepreneurs. I just, everything about entrepreneurs, personality, you know, the, the strength we have in business and, and the, uh, the ambition, the passion, I love entrepreneurs. So I'm pumped to be here and I'm excited to hopefully give some value to your audience and hopefully give some inspiration to everybody. Absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. And of course, got a bunch of links below too. You can find Josh Hall at joshhall.co. Also the podcast, YouTube channel, He's doing a lot of really cool things. So we're going to see how this conversation goes. But I, I also just, you know, before I get into my first question here for you, Josh, just to kind of lay this up and contextualize it a little bit. In the past two days, the past 24 hours, actually, I've spoken to two people that are in a similar spot, right? Building a business. They're not sure if it's going in the right direction. They're starting to see some breadcrumbs, some changes starting to come in, but they're not sure if it's going the right way. So I just want to kind of back you up a few years and say, what was the point in your web design that you're like, okay, this, this is it. I'm in the right lane. I'm going to double down. What would that look like? Well, it's interesting with this because I think this is really common across all industries, which is there's usually a little momentum at first, and it seems like there's a dry spell after that. Whether that momentum is a couple months or a year, whatever it is, I had I have a lot of web design students. One of them actually just got through that dry spell to where it started off all awesome, and then it just seems like there's no clients or something dries up. What I found is it really is all about progress. And I know that's very overused, but it's day-to-day -day progress in your journey. And if you stick with it, if you continue to level yourself up and work on personal development and your sales and your marketing content, which I know you're really big on, Mark, things do tend to turn around. How long that turns around, that depends on how hard you work and how smart you work. But one of my students just went through it. She emailed me literally yesterday and said, Josh, thank you so much for encouraging me to stick with it because I am like flooded with work now. So for anyone who's on that path or trajectory where you might be in that dry spell where you just need a little more momentum, just stick with it. Keep on doing what you're doing. Work smart, work hard, and it always turns around. So I don't know if that's the best answer to the question, but when it comes to feeling like if you're on the right path, that's what worked for me. Once I started getting past that dry spell, that's when it really started going wild for me. Uh, this makes a lot of sense to me, and I experience it too. And I, I kind of try to encourage people out there because this topic of burnout, of drying out, of not knowing every, like entrepreneurship is big, right? Like every Instagram model is an, is an entrepreneur, right? If you take a picture in front of the bang energy, you are an entrepreneur, right? But it is, it is so hard to sustain it. And over time, I've begun to get an immense amount of respect for people like you who have carved something out of nothing and built it into something that's, that's sustainable and growable. So we, I, I definitely talk a little bit about that evolution, but I, I just, I do want to know, like, was there, was there a particular client or a particular aha moment, or is this just like a, is this like a continual evolution in yourself, a continual innovation, keep opening new doors? Or was there a specific door that you open? It was just like, ding, this is it. 
Yeah, there wasn't like a, uh, a light bulb, huge one moment. It was a lot of little moments that just continued to, to help me feel more confident and excited about what I was doing. And to be honest, when I started my web design business, I had no intention of actually starting a business, which is really common for a lot of entrepreneurs. We tend to mm. just start fiddling around doing something on the side often, and it ends up becoming a lot more than we thought it would. That was the case for me. My whole goal was to be a website designer for an agency. I started taking night classes in my community college. I'm based here in Columbus, Ohio, really great tech scene. So I knew there was a lot of agencies. I had full intention of just learning web design and graphic design and, and being a designer. When I started doing freelance, I started making enough money. And once I got past that dry period that I just talked about, I started getting job and started getting referrals and after, you know, job after job after job. I look back in, in the first year, I think it was the second year I was doing freelance while I was in night school, I made like 30 grand. And I thought, mm -hmm. wow, if I did 30 grand kind of on the side with freelance, if I did this full time, I bet I could double that or triple that and get to six figures. And that's exactly what I did. So that gave me the confidence to kind of go to that next level and really, really pull for it seriously. And then in short, just to kind of summarize my entire journey as a web designer, I was a freelance solopreneur web designer for about six or seven years. And then I started scaling and you talked about the effects of burnout and loss of passion or things like that. I did have to go through a lot of that and learn how to balance that, particularly when I started scaling my web design agency. Uh, and that was all before I started this brand with my personal brand at joshhall.co where I teach. So uh, yep. I hope that answers your question. That's definitely what I experienced in that time period, though. Uh, it, it, it totally does. It totally does. And I, I want to talk a little bit about how you keep the momentum going. And I want to go deeper on that. But before I just have a quick rapid fire question for you here. Are you part of any sort of membership, mentorship, mentor community, mastermind community? Have you leveraged anything like that to get through those tough times? There's two I'm in right now. Uh, I think you had our fellow colleague, Pat Flynn, on your show. He's a, yeah. a really close mentor of mine. I've had him on the podcast as well. Awesome, awesome mentor. Great entrepreneur. Uh, I'm a part of SPI Pro, which is the Smart Passive Income uh, Professional Community by Pat Flynn. And then I'm also in a online community called Superfast Business, which is by an awesome guy named James Shrampko, author of Work Less, Make More. Those are the two communities I'm a part of that help me uh, either directly or indirectly when there's ever those times of doubt or dry periods, or sometimes you set goals for yourself and you don't hit them, or you feel like you could just be doing a little better. Um, that's yeah. kind of, that's kind of what I have with those. I am a part of a mastermind group as well. It's just a couple close friends. That's a little more intimate. So all those combined, that's my support system for sure. Okay, super, super key. And again, I've been putting a lot of emphasis on this because as I bring on amazing creators like yourself, Pat Flynn, Jasmine Starr, Evan Carmichael, David Meltzer, the list goes on and on. I'm starting to see these common denominators. Every single one is either part of a mastermind or credits a lot of their success to being part of the mastermind or by having a specific mentor that really helped them to level up. And anyway, it's something I've been thinking about because I think it's after hours entrepreneurs, we we're just a little scrap for change. We don't have tons of money running around, but I think that like when you move from that crawling to that walking phase, I still, I think it's going to be much easier to get to that running phase of your business. If you start surrounding yourself with these, these resources, it's a great point, Mark. And look, entrepreneurship is lonely. I, I think that's something yep. that a lot of people forget about most of the time. Here's warning. Most of the time you're an entrepreneur, it's you behind your computer by yourself. So the more community you can get involved with and the times you can have calls that aren't just client calls, but actual, like, I want to talk about what I'm going through, or I want to talk about where I'm at, where I want to get to. Those are key. And what's interesting about this and the reason I've invested in myself in these communities that I'm a part of is because I have a community that I run for my web design students, which is a premium community. But the problem is, as the creator, I can't really talk to them like I do my mastermind because they're yeah. following me. It's you know what I mean. It's a little bit different when you run a community. It's, it's, it's like a very, student teacher. Yeah, it's like the teacher being like, guys, I'm just I'm not you know super confident <laughs> about this. It's it doesn't quite have the same appeal. I'm very transparent with my students, but there's a different level at you when you talk to somebody you're working for or you're working with versus somebody you actually trust in that type of relationship. So that is key. You really do. You've got to surround yourself with people who are either at your level in your same wavelength or people who are where you want to get to. And that's the really powerful thing is when you hang around people where you want to get to go. That's that's the real key with any sort of premium club or membership or a mastermind group. Well said. Well said. And I, I really uh, liked that you said 
that this is something that every entrepreneur basically goes through this, this kind of like lonely feeling. It's not necessarily a bad feeling. It's just, that's part of it, I think. But, um, if, if this resonates with you, I want you to do something right now. When you go to Instagram, I want you to find at Josh Hall co right. Josh Hall yep. co. I want you to go and find Josh and tell him Josh that, that what you just said made sense to me. I want you to go to at Josh Hall co on Instagram and let him know that that resonated with you because I, I think it does. It resonates with me. So definitely hit Josh up. I appreciate that, man. I actually just recently launched my Instagram. I took forever to, to set it up and then I finally decided to go for it. And I've really enjoyed it. It's much less polarizing than Facebook or some other places. So uh, yeah, I would love to connect with anybody there. And you know, I was just thinking too, on that point real quick, one thing entrepreneurs have to remember is our family and our support systems at home are going to try to support us, but they just, they often don't know what it's like to be an entrepreneur unless they're an entrepreneur themselves. Like my wife, she does not know. I mean, she tries to support me and she's been with me for a long time. She kind of knows the business now, but in the beginning I had a hard time explaining what I did and the kind of hardships I went through. <laughs> my family are all salary workers. I am the black sheep in my family. There's not an entrepreneurial bone in anybody in my family. So I did not get the type of support from them, even though they tried, that I get from other people who are going through it. And that is the key because you will feel alone. If you don't have some sort of support system, you will feel alone. And, and Google can be your best friend, particularly as a web designer, but you definitely want to surround yourself with people who are going through it with you. So I didn't think we were going to take this tangent or so early on in the conversation, but it is really important for entrepreneurship. Yeah, 100%. And it's funny that you said that because I remember when I just started my journey about four years, three and a half years ago, and try, tried to explain to my wife what I was doing. And, uh, you know, I would have, hey, what do you think about this post? Or what do you think about it? was like crickets. I was not yeah. getting anything back. And I, I love you, babe. You, I could not be where I'm at without you, but it, it really rings true. It really well, rings true. Depending on what industry you're in, it gets even trickier with family because it was a lot easier for me to tell my family, I'm a web designer. So, okay, I build websites. Well, now I am an authority in the web design realm. I am a coach. I'm a YouTuber. I'm a podcaster. Most of my family still has no idea what I do. So it can be equally <laughs> tricky depending on the complexity of your setup. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. 100%. I actually, I had a client reach out to me because I run a, a, an insurance agency by day after hours entrepreneur, digital media agency by night, if you would. And I had a client say, hey, Mark, you know, I love what you're doing with this thing. I'm not sure exactly what you're doing, but you should just, you know, go in on insurance. Insurance is the future for you. I'm like, all right, thanks. You know, but that, that's not <laughs> working. That's not working. And so again, just speaks yeah. to your point about how important it is to have that support system. It, I, I really think that that's everything. So I appreciate you being so open about that. It means a lot. Okay. So I'm going to fast forward this conversation or rewind the conversation a little bit to this point you made where if you're going to get through those hard times, you need to persevere. You need to get through those lulls because it's, it's, it's kind of just what we see. Now I found that podcasting is a really good way of getting through those lulls because it helps you to continue to build your brand and helps you to bring in new leads. So, you know, you start in web design. So I just kind of want to just kind of get a story from you. I want to hear from you, Josh. What was that moment where you said, okay, I'm going to try podcasting. Rewind that for me. What was that moment like? Well, my podcast is for web designers. So I did not have a podcast when I was just a web designer. So just to, to give you a snapshot of what I do now, that essentially came when I started teaching web design. I, like I mentioned, I was a web designer, solopreneur for six, seven years. I started scaling and, and grew a small team. I never had a legit agency, but when I started scaling, I was also a part of a mentoring program here in Columbus, Ohio for high school students. And I realized that I had a knack for teaching because I was teaching kids about entrepreneurship and web design and it went over really well. So then I thought, man, what if I could teach at scale? And then I got an opportunity to blog for Elegant Themes, which are the creators of the, the Divi WordPress theme, which is a massive theme in the market. So I got a really cool opportunity to share what I learned in my journey and my design and in my agency. And that's what planted the seed for me to launch joshhall.co to start teaching. That's when I got really serious about content. So I did that. I was actually a course creator and a teacher and a mentor for a couple years before I started my podcast. I had done a YouTube channel before that, and I still have a YouTube channel, but I love podcasting. It suits my personality because I like to go in depth on stuff. 
I like to not be rust. We were talking about being rust before we went live. Uh, I yeah. hate having to cram my thoughts into 10 minutes to keep people on a, on a YouTube video. There's nothing better than really being able to share your thoughts as long as it's thrift and it's not fluffy with a bunch of stuff. No one needs to hear, but you can really dive into something in podcasting. And that's what I like about it. And here's one thing to remember too. If anyone's considering doing a podcast, I highly, highly recommend it for a lot of reasons, but there's one big reason. There's a ton of studies that show, and you can just Google this, podcast listeners generally have a much larger income than people looking for answers on YouTube, depending on the industry or any other mediums. Podcast listeners tend to be often six-figure income earners, so they're very likely to invest more. And there is something about a podcast in particular that builds trust and authority and likability more so than any other medium. And I've really found this true because a lot of my students, my web design students now, I would say, honestly, Mark, like a good 75% of them say, I love your podcast. I got addicted to your podcast and now they're in all my courses. So there's a lot of power with podcasting. Uh, I don't know that was the best quick answer to your question, but in short, I chose podcasting because I knew it suited my personality and I thought I might be pretty good at it because I, I got better at talking and, uh, turns out it's one of the best business decisions I ever made for my business. I love So why do you say that? Why would you say it's the best business decision since you started your business? What, what makes you say that? Well, the numbers don't lie, uh, for sure. So <laughs> when I say that about 75% of students say they love my podcast, that says a lot there because they're paying to be there. So I recognize pretty early on, wow, more and more people are coming into my courses saying, I love your podcast. So that was like a, that was a ding, ding, ding moment right there. Mm. Um, so that was a big, there were, there was definitely, there is a return on investment there for sure. The other aspect of it, and I think you've talked about this. I, I listened to a couple of your episodes before doing this. And I think you mentioned it in one of them. It's the relationships and partnerships that it, you get exposed to as a yeah. podcaster. That's equally as valuable. Um, I would have never had a chance to talk to Pat Flynn, a world-class entrepreneur, if I didn't have a podcast. Pat's, Pat's a busy dude. He's not going to just take a, a random call from a guy in Columbus, Ohio to just chat yeah. for a little bit. But I had a podcast which opened the door for that opportunity. Uh, I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now if I didn't have a podcast and you hadn't heard about my show. So there's a lot of uh, benefits both monetarily and professionally. I think a, another aspect to podcasting itself is if I could put this in like a, a third a benefit for this is the personal growth that you have. Podcasting yes. is one of actually the quickest ways to level up self, self-improvement and learn. Like when I have a guest on, I learn something amazing every time. So it's almost like it bypasses, I guess you're kind of killing two birds in one stone. Actually, you're killing like, you're killing a ton of birds because you're boosting your revenue, you're growing your income and you are making, you know, relationships with people, with guests, you're boosting trust and authority with your brand, you're learning. So, you know, I'm all about online courses and stuff, but you can also learn a lot by just asking questions and being curious. So a lot of reasons I love podcasting and it definitely, I think both common sense wise, I knew I was learning. I knew I was loving doing podcasting. My numbers were going up and up, which is another really good sign. And then my revenue was going up. And a lot of my mm. students were saying, I love your podcast, which that was the, that was the sign for me that I'm going to continue to do this. And here's a little entrepreneurial lesson that I wish Josh 10 years ago would listen to. If something is working on a small level, even if it's working for 10 people, it will work for 50 and it will work mm. for a hundred and it will work for a thousand. You can scale it. So, uh, whatever's working on a small level, keep at it, keep doing it because my podcast numbers were not great when I just started. I did have an audience, which helped, but my podcast numbers weren't massive, but they converted. They converted at a high level. Even the 50 people, 100 people that started listening, they were in it. And now I yeah. get an average of 1,000 to 2,000 downloads per episode, which isn't massive, but my audience is highly engaged and they're extremely valuable. So another little business lesson I wish I would have learned early on. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, this is all really, really great. And it actually reminds me of something that John Lee Dumas said when he, he was on the show a few few episodes ago. He said, if you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. And this this idea of the the average income point that you made a few minutes ago, I think it's really interesting, too. If you if you're trying to reach a high 
uh, a demographic, a psychographic that has expendable income, podcasts are a great way to reach them. And I want to, I just want to put a statement out there, Josh, and I want to know if you agree or disagree with this based on your experience. I, I feel like we're moving, the world is moving into a direction where every single business owner, every single freelancer, every single entrepreneur needs to have some sort of show. They need to have some sort of show with which they can base content off of. I just think that's the way that media is going. What do you think? Agree or disagree? I do agree. Uh, I'm a big proponent of video and I know a lot of web designers in my industry are terrified of video because <laughs> you don't get into web design to be on camera. You get into, into web design to be behind a computer and do stuff. But if you are going to be the face of your business, and this isn't just for web designers, this is for everybody, you have to realize you are the salesperson. You're, you're wearing all the hats in the beginning. So whether you like sales yeah. and whether you feel comfortable, it doesn't matter. You have to do it. And I, this is coming from somebody who was not good on camera and was terrified when there was a light shining on myself years ago. I was really bad on camera. I used to get so nervous. I would be super comfortable in a meeting and I would do one-on-ones with clients and it would go awesome. Soon as there was a camera and a light on me, I would freeze up and it'd be deer in the headlights. But I just started doing it over and over and over and I got more comfortable. I also realized, and I think this comes into play when you have a quote unquote show, whether that's just some videos on your website or whether you have a podcast or a YouTube channel or any sort of content, Anytime you repeat yourself over and over and over and over again, you can save yourself so much time by making it a podcast or making it a video that you can yep. just put out. And I, I had to learn that early on when I started what I do now, because I was creating tutorials based off of questions that people were asking me or that I had as a web designer. And just this week, I got three questions about how to hire and scale for subcontractors. So guess what I did? A little test for the audience. If you can guess what I did, I made a podcast episode about it. That way yes. I don't have to say the same thing every time and retype everything out. I'm just going to make a podcast. It's going to help thousands of people all over the world. And I can send it to them and say, Hey, here are my top tips. I actually go into this in more detail in this podcast episode. Boom. You just save yourself time. You just elevated your trust authority. And if that goes to a potential client, you might get a sale. So there's a lot of different uh, tactics and tricks for creating a, a show. I'm trying to think if there might be a better word for somebody who doesn't feel like they're a host of something. Um, but if you create content, video, podcasts, whatever, you can multi-purpose it and answer so many questions that way. It's, it's funny that that's how you got started. That's exactly how I started on YouTube because I was learning on YouTube and I said, and, or actually let me back it up. A, I was learning on YouTube and B, I kept getting the same questions over and over and over again. So I started creating videos to answer the questions. And then as I inevitably got more questions, I could just say, Hey, check out this video. Yeah. And that I, is super powerful and very scalable. Very, very scalable. Yeah. Because there's nothing worse than have to repeat yourself over and over. And I learned that later on when I was, even when I was a solopreneur, I got sick of answering the same questions that clients had over and over. So what I did, and this may be applicable to anyone right now who is still not convinced to do a podcast or a YouTube show or something. I made a client resources page for my web design clients. And it was basically just a set of tutorials answering the most common questions that I got as a web designer all the time. So I would consider that a, a little bit as kind of a show. Like it was, it was some place that my clients could go they can, I could answer those questions without actually typing them over and over. And it really boosted my expertise. Like my clients were like, whoa, this, this guy looks legit. He's got like resources paid for all his clients. So there's another little tip that I think anyone could implement uh, as kind of a, a little, a little dip in your toe into the, to the shallow end of the pool when it comes to content and hosting something. I really like that idea of having a resources page for clients, by the way, I'm writing that one down. That is definitely going in the notepad. It was right a game changer. Now, yeah. What was funny, yeah. actually, funny enough, man, when I said that I, I got to be a blog author for Elegant Themes, um, that was the single page that got them interested in me. I told the huh. content manager what I was up to because he, he, long story short, he ended up living in Columbus, Ohio. I just reached out to him and I said, hey, man, I use, I use your products. Would you be interested in getting coffee? I'd love to buy you a coffee. We chatted. He did it. And then he found out what I was up to with my business. And I told him about the client resources page. And he was like, dude, He's like, we've never had anyone talk about that. Would you be interested in sharing what you know on our blog? And that's how it all started for me. So um, I still don't think that many service industries are doing that. I mean, more and more people are empowering clients. But if you put yourself on video or even if you just do a screen share, so you're not actually on camera, it's just your screen, it will do you so much good and you will save yeah. so much time. 
Again, I'm going to beat a dead horse here by saying the same stuff, but it will increase your trust, authority, everything that will help grow your business. And, it, 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 and one of the, the other advantages is it, it allows you to actually give better, more thorough answers to questions rather than just DMing an Instagram, which I just, I can't do it anymore. I yes. can't have yes. any, actually can't educate you at all just doing Instagram DMs. So it's hugely valuable. Can I give you the most valuable point real quick before we move on? Please. You, you can raise your rates because if you empower your clients, you are more valuable. So client mm. empowerment is a biggie when it comes to raising rates. And this doesn't matter what industry you're in. The more value you provide, the more you can charge. So when I told clients, I provide you resources that will empower you and I will be alongside you every step of the way, suddenly I was much more than the average web designer, quote unquote, who was just building a quick website and going to disappear. So another yeah. little tip there, you can raise your rates when you're more valuable. Yeah, love that. And I, this is, these concepts that we're talking about here, the scalability of teaching and whatnot, I, I think is, again, probably the most important skill to learn over the next 10, 20 years. And I also think that if you're not learning these skills, if you're not learning how to communicate digitally and scaling your, your digital footprint, you're in for your, your head in the wrong direction, but I'm not going to stay on that too long because if you're listening to the show, you already understand, you get it, you get how important it is. So I want to get into the nitty gritty here, but I also, um, because Josh has been so gracious to give us a little bit extra time. Cause I want to talk about web design. Okay. I want to talk about web design. Frankly, I want to, I want to look in this for all the YouTube viewers. You can watch the show on YouTube and we're going to be doing a little bit of screen sharing here. Now I'm going to, we're going to explain it. So you're going to have a good listening experience, but this is also going to be on YouTube link below. Make sure you subscribe. And I also want to encourage you to check out what Josh Hall is doing over at joshhall.co. If you like what he's saying, that's joshhall.co. Check him out. Give him a shout out. All right, holler. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about web design, and I want to actually bring. I'm going to share my screen here, and I want to look at your uh, your website, Josh, because you've, right. you've got you you've made some interesting choices that are contrary to some of my traditional beliefs on what a website should look like. Right? Oh, and I, I think, like it. A challenge. Let's do it. Yeah, I want to challenge you, but I I also I guess I want to preface this while I'm bringing it up here. Is there any one right way to make a website, or does it depend on the person, the design? It, yeah, there's no right or wrong with web design. It really, it what I try to stick to are common best practices, but it really depends on the industry. It depends on the customer. It depends on what services you have and how simple or complex you need to make your website. I think at the end of the day, the most important thing to remember is with any website is it should guide the user. It should be a journey for them to get to the mm -hmm. information that they need to get to, whether it's an answer to a question or whether it's a solution to a service. Those are generally the two most common things. Answers to questions, which are blog posts, podcast, YouTube, content marketing, and then solution to a server uh, to a problem, which would be an actual service, something that somebody buys as a product or a service that they would you know, sign up for as a consultant or whatever it is. Those are really the two main things you got to figure out what you want to do. And then you can kind of boil it down from there as far as making sure whoever gets to your website knows where to go, what to do and get the result that they're looking for. Okay. 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 So before we share your screen, I want to stay on this for just a minute here. Um, take your audience on a journey. They land on your page. You want to take them to it through a journey, right? How do I say this? So let's, I'll just use myself as an example. I'm, I, I run a digital media agency. I'm trying to book clients either for consultation or for services, right? We run your podcast for you, right? So if I bring someone on a journey, like what's the first thing that someone should see when they land on my page? Should it just be a big picture of my face? Should it be a giant link? Should it be two words? Should it be a hundred words? Like, Help me out here. Uh, best. Well, so there's one really important thing to remember with this. Most people are not going to land on your homepage first, especially if you're doing content. If you're doing podcasts and videos and blog posts, you will get a lot more traffic to your blog post pages because Google is going to pull up an answer to a question before your homepage. Your homepage unless it's just a landing page, like a one page style site, it's generally not going to answer a question. It's going to be the kind of the, the, if I can use the analogy of a tree, it's going to be like the trunk. It's going to be where all the rest of the branches and answers and services mm. kind of go back to. So your homepage, while really important, super powerful, is going to be more of the trunk that links to the rest of your site. So a lot of people mistakenly think the homepage is what they need. I mean, you do want to optimize it, but just remember, 
if you're doing content, people are likely going to get to your content pages first. Case in point, my site gets way more traffic to a handful of my most popular blog posts than it does on my homepage. And we can even, I can look at my analytics here if we want to dive into it, but that is definitely the case. So with that in mind, you definitely want to have a very clear menu, a very clear menu. That is a journey. Again, it's, it's the main links that are going to help people navigate where they want to get to their site, because a lot of people will end up going to a blog post and then going back to your homepage. That's actually really common on my site. They'll find one of my tutorials or a podcast episode, then they'll go back to my homepage. So essentially, if I could give you the, the best practices in a very brief amount of time, you will want to organize your site for the most important links that are then going to branch out to your different services, your different content, and they should all be on your homepage somewhere as kind of the, the trunk. Again, you might grab onto a branch on the tree, but the trunk is what holds it all together. So your homepage is kind of the, it's kind of the snapshot version of what you do. Uh, to answer your question, Mark, how much text should be on the, the above the fold, which is what we in the web design world call the section before you scroll down, you should definitely have a title that explains why they're there and what the result they're going to get as a whole. And then depending on how much more, you know, description text do you want to add below that? It's totally up to you. I definitely recommend a strong call to action before anybody scrolls. A lot of, mm -hmm. um, how do I say this? Old school clients are terrified of scrolling. For some reason, back in the 90s, it was all about just a flat landing page that you never had to scroll. But it's, I don't know when this episode's coming out, but it's 2021 when we're recording this. And no one's afraid to scroll. Everyone scrolls constantly. But you still want to have a call to action immediately in case someone's going to take action right there. So a strong header, a strong heading that's going to tell them what to do. And you've got my screen pulled up right now. So I'll just say what mine is for everyone just listening. My little tagline, my heading is learn how to build awesome websites and create a web design business that gives you freedom and a lifestyle you love. The build awesome websites and create a web design business are both in green because that's my color. Those are kind mm -hmm. of the two main areas I help web designers. And then the result is you get freedom and a lifestyle you love because you can build awesome websites and grow your web design business. So that when I changed my website to that heading, I saw a massive increase in uh, conversions to my course pages. I also found less bounce rate, which essentially means a bounce rate means people are going to your site and then they leave without doing anything. And my bounce rate went down dramatically once I just changed that heading. So just a heading change can make a massive impact to your website. Uh, so, okay. We, we just, I mean, this could be an entire course on its own this last uh, five <laughs> minutes. So I, I there, there's a few concepts that I want to uh, kind of want to touch on here. So the first one is, uh, is, is, uh, is about the heading, right? So when I look at your heading, are you being really focused on keywords and search? Like, how did you get to the point where I know that build awesome websites, create a web design businesses is, is all highlighted in green. I actually, I, that makes sense because that's what your eye is drawn to immediately. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Another, I actually have another question on this page itself. So you're, you're very well branded green, green and green and black basically are the two main brand colors, you know, green, like a neon green, kind of like my shirt too, by the way, for all you YouTubers, I actually wore <laughs> this specifically because I know that Josh is branded green. So a question here throughout your website, I've, I've heard this said that you want to have like maybe one type of button. Uh, or maybe certain types of things that are highlighted in a different color to really, like really stand out and really draw attention to that one little thing. I don't see you do that on your website much. Is there a reason for that? No, not necessarily. I had thought about it. Uh, in web design, we typically have what we call primary colors and secondary colors. So my color scheme is very simple. It's essentially three colors. It's my green. It is it's what's actually a very dark blue and then a lighter type of gray. Um, so it is fairly simple or basic, you might say. I have considered adding an accent color, which would be maybe a purple or something that really kind of elevates that. I still might consider that. I often tell my students to do that. But I just, I haven't actually, I just, I actually have not done that myself, mainly because I just, I like sticking with that color format. And for anyone who goes to my site, you'll see that the green buttons generally tend to stand out from the rest of the page. So yes. it doesn't blend with the background or anything like that. So um, I've actually, I haven't thought about that in probably a couple of years, but now you're totally going to make me rethink that Mark, but <laughs> it is something that uh, can definitely help. The, the issue you run into, particularly if you're working with a client that has a lot of branded colors is you can't deviate from their color scheme. 
Um, you can add secondary colors in there occasionally, but I, this is really common too with like photography sites. You'll see a lot of photography sites that are just one color or two colors. And what is really popping out are the images. So I actually have that same approach as well. The less colors you have on your website, generally the images are going to pop out a little more. Um, Very interesting. I also, I just want to point out that it's, there's just, there's like a, an, uh, almost like an elegance and simplicity, I think, because when you start trying to add in, you know, primary, secondary accent, accent two, and all these different hex codes, it, it, it like you said, it almost, it almost drowns out or becomes too complicated to actually design the page that you're trying to make, you know? Yeah. Well, so do me a favor here, Mark, for anyone watching live, go to courses, click on web design courses and just choose any course you want to check go, go to the, uh, maybe the website maintenance plan course, which actually that's kind of a green too. So maybe, maybe choose a different one. That's not a, uh, green color because I'll, I'll show you one other benefit of having a fairly simple type website. Uh, choose any of those courses and I'll, and I'll show you what yeah, I mean. So you can just, just to kind of contextualize this for everyone that's listening. So we're, you know, obviously he's, I mean, honestly, this website is really gorgeous. It's very, very I, I love the simplicity, great menus at the top. And when we click on, uh, or when we hover over the course design over courses as a drop down with course designs. And now we see a, a bunch of different types of courses reasonably costed too, 200 to 500 bucks. And like you said, they have different colors to them. So let's click so, on this blue one and walk me yeah, through. Yeah. So here, here's the big impact, which was actually kind of unintentional. I'd love to say this was a part of my master plan. The truth is when I started creating courses, I knew that I wanted to differentiate my courses. So Every course of mine is a different color. That way you're on the business course right now, which is kind of a teal blue. Any graphic that I do with the business course is going to be that teal blue. I'll have my mm. other set, you know, standard colors in there, but suddenly the teal blue makes that pop out from the rest of the site. So if I had purple and pink and green and yellow in my menu, that's suddenly going to conflict with the rest of this. So that's actually another little branding approach too, is you can brand your services. I actually worked with a, a business coach years ago. They had a different color for each one of their programs. So it was actually pretty cool because their site was very simple. And then each one of their programs had a different color, which really made it pop out. So pretty, pretty, uh, pretty cool little different trick there you could implement. Yeah, I like that. It's really clean. And, and I, I also think that you, you bring up a good point about having all these colors kind of like, I don't want to use the word muddled, but I'm using the word muddled. You've got all these different colors that are muddled into your page. And then you, you, it, it almost becomes too distracting. You can't actually bring attention to the things you really want to bring attention to. Right. So exactly. There's a big, big rule with color management, which is called hierarchy and hierarchy applies to text and fonts. Of course, the, the heading fonts that you should have on your website should be big, should be bold generally. And then your body text should be a little smaller. Your call to action should be, you know, uh, a something that it, that stands out. Same thing with color. If you have a brand that is just all over the place with colors, it's difficult to tell what's going to stand out. It's like, well, what color should my, should my buttons be? If I've got every color in the book on there, I worked with a, uh, a balloon artist who was like a magician and his branding was literally every single color. So it was one of those challenging projects I had was to figure out what color should I, you know, make his buttons. So yeah, the, the, <laughs> sometimes the minimalist designs give you a lot more freedom to make powerful accent colors. Which I like, and it's again simplicity, so underrated. It's and simplicity is so underrated. Um, I, it, so I've heard the the this, I guess, concept used where you're going sixty thirty ten with your colors, sixty percent primary, thirty uh, percent secondary, ten percent accent is is kind of like a rule of thumb that I've been playing with. That's good. Yeah, I would back that up. I totally back that up. That that sounds like a very sound judgment for color management and color theory. <laughs> Love it. Love it. So I, uh, I want to ask you about your podcast page here. The podcast is Josh Hall web design show. That's Josh Hall web design show. So we're on the, we're on the podcast page of your website. And I, I just want to ask like, what's there's, is there any science going on here? Cause one of the, okay, I'm just going to back this up a little bit. One of the problems I have with sending people to a, a particular website is it's, it's much harder to subscribe to a podcast unless you're inside a specific player like iTunes, like Spotify, et cetera. How, how do you, how do you see that operating when you have a central website? People can't necessarily subscribe on the website, right? They have to go to a certain channel. How do you, how do you handle that? 
Yeah, it kind of goes back to the idea of the homepage idea to where like all of these other links and these branches are going to take you back to the podcast page or to the homepage. Same thing here. My podcast page has links to iTunes, Spotify, and all the actual podcast episodes that we format and push out. These should eventually link back to the podcast page. It's, it's the same approach I have with a website as a whole that I'll have with linking to like a main services page. It really, I, I think the analogy of the tree is the best way to kind of visualize yeah. what that looks like. So the thing with the podcast page is there's a lot of reasons I formatted it just like this. First of all, remembering that a lot of people come to my blog and they will see a blog post. They'll either go to my homepage and then if they see a podcast, they're like, oh, he has a podcast. Going back to what you said earlier, Mark, it really elevates my brand as an authority and builds trust by having a podcast. And then they're like, Oh, yeah. holy cow. Josh has over 150 episodes. Like this isn't like he just did a few episodes and stopped. He's like committed to this. So there must be some, some notoriety. And there's like, Oh my gosh, he's had Pat Flynn on the show, James Shramko, maybe Mark Savant one day. Like there's a <laughs> lot of, there's a lot of uh, notoriety there too. And then people can go from there where they want to listen. So they can click off to iTunes and subscribe there or to Spotify or where they ever want to go. But again, I've found it really, really important to have a hub for everything. It's so important from a usability standpoint, but also for SEO. Um, we have to remember too, Google yeah. is often, well, Google is essentially a matchmaker. It's looking for answers to the questions that you might have. And if you can link all of the answers to your questions in this nice, tidy little linking branch back to the tree, then boom, you're, it really goes a long way. So that's kind of the, uh, the mindset behind that. Yeah. It, it, you're making a lot of sense here, Josh. You're making a lot of sense. And, and listen, if he's making sense to you, I definitely when you go to Instagram at Josh Hall Co at Josh Hall Co and tell him, Josh, you're making a lot of sense right now. Thanks for sharing. Okay. So uh, another quick question here to piggyback off the podcast idea show notes. I'm assuming you think very important because of SEO search engine. Yeah. I mean, the more you can add in your show notes, the best for SEO for sure. Now I will say if anyone checks out my podcast, I don't want anyone to be overwhelmed by the amount of work that goes into each post because every one of my podcasts does have an outline with timestamps, a description and a full transcription. However, I have a VA that does this for me and yeah. she does the bulk of all this work. All I do when I get done recording a podcast is I write up the initial description and then she does everything from there. So she does the transcription timestamps and all that. I did not, however, start my podcast with this much. All I did at the, at the start was just have a description and then links. That was it. Um, I ended up adding more and more as we went along because I saw how powerful it was for people to see uh, an outline and timestamps. It was also helpful for me when I wanted to repurpose content to look at an episode and say, okay, let's say I have you on eventually, Mark. And I say, Mark talks about something really cool. Where was that? I don't remember. I can look in the outline and probably find it a lot faster. Um, and then interestingly enough, the transcriptions I was hesitant to add because I wasn't sure how many people would read them. But when I started adding them, because I have a global audience and I am helping people all over the world, I have a lot of web design students who are not natively English speakers. So I have a lot of people who learn English as a second language and the transcriptions help them out dramatically because now they can listen or watch the show because I do video versions like yourself and they can read the transcription. I actually had one of my students say that she's learning English by listening to my podcast, which is completely and utterly terrifying because I often mix words together and I often make up words almost every show. So she's going to have a very interesting vocabulary uh, as she <laughs> listens to the podcast more and more. But yeah, those are kind of the main thoughts with how robust, you know, those are now, but I didn't start that way. Yeah. Well, listen, you always start somewhere and I, I just want to like my superpower as it were is, is, is finding ways to repurpose content, right? Find a great piece of anchor content and the way that you have timestamped these different points of your show is going to make it really easy to communicate with a team. I have a team of seven different people right now that are helping with the production of the show. So I like this idea of getting things timestamped out again, then I can go through and I could say, Hey, uh, video editor the, at, at minute 20, 37, we talk about a really important topic. Definitely want to make that into a YouTube shorter. Definitely want to make that into a clip. 
Yeah, it really, really helps. Even if the exact clip isn't labeled in the outline, you'll generally be able to find it a lot faster. Yeah. Uh, and then the episodes that I have a guest, they're actually even more built out than that. It has the YouTube video. It's got their links. Um, so if you go to just podcasts and then go to uh, an episode that has a guest for me, Mark, you'll see that there's a little more to those, those interviews. So um, yeah, let's look at one here. Yeah, so you can just go to podcasts. And yeah, if you want to go to the to the next one there with my man Massimo. Um, it's pretty cool. Yep. There's a little more to it, a little more information. There's the YouTube video, which one thing important to remember too, when it comes to your website, along with YouTube, everyone needs to remember Google owns YouTube, which means YouTube is an extremely underrated search engine optimization tool. Um, a lot of my videos are getting picked up. Even my podcasts are getting picked up on YouTube before my website comes up now, which is really interesting. So um, a lot of those snippets, if you're answering a question, a lot of those snippets will come up as what's called a featured image or a, uh, um, a like a featured snippet on Google, which is really, really powerful. So uh, if you can combine YouTube along with a blog post on your website, it's a win-win. And then you can multi-purpose that content. It's, it's, it's really a strong strategy. What, and I, what you're referring to is just embedding that YouTube video into your website, right? Just exactly. Yeah. You, yep. Yeah. You can embed it in your website. And then suddenly there are now two links for Google to find. Now you don't often, mm. sometimes they can compete with each other, which as long as it's you, you can compete with yourself as much as you want. Uh, but it's pretty cool because some of these interviews, you will see my blog post with joshhall.co slash, you know, whatever the episode is. And then you will see the video under it. And the video is just on YouTube. So they really work out together nicely. It's really beautiful. Like, listen, y'all, you definitely want to check out this page. That's joshhall.co. Really, really pretty page. I'm getting some inspiration. Um, and listen, listen, Josh, we're going a little long. We're running short on time because we only got him for another 12 minutes here. I, I, I just want to give you a chance to gut my page. I want to show you my website. It's okay. Needs a, it needs a rehaul. I want to give you a chance to gut my page, A, because I want to look at this two years from now and be like, wow, what, what the heck was I doing? <laughs> Um, and B, I want you to help me get there. So I'm going to kind of screen share my page right now. Uh, the first thing I want to point out is my branded colors here are off. Okay. But I just kind of want to scroll down and I want to get your opinion. Like Mark, that sucks. That sucks. Give it, give it to me here. Well, okay. So quick website review. This is spur of the moment, which actually is great. Sometimes the spur of the moment thoughts are often the best. So first off, Mark, it's a great website. This is not something where I'm like, Oh man, you got a, you got a lot of work to do. Um, I think it looks nice. You've got a you got an accent color in yellow that really pops off the dark blue, which is nice. You got the picture of yourself. I assume since it is Mark Savant Media that that is Mark. A lot of people tend yeah. to just have a brand like a company name, and then there's just some guy or some gal there, and they're like, "Well, who who is that?" Um, Generally, anytime there's a picture of yourself, if it doesn't say your name in the company, I would have like a little arrow that just says like, hey, I'm Mark CEO or whatever uh, you call yourself. But since you have your name in there, I think that's fine. I may even do that on my site, even though it's at joshhall.co. I had thought about putting a little arrow that just says, I'm Josh, your web design coach. Uh, as simple as that. But that cool, all looks like good. It's, I like that really, little, I'm a web design, I'm your, I'm your web design coach. I like that. Yeah. I'm your web design coach. So you would say, if you could say I'm your or anything, you might say I'm your strategist or consultant. Um, now better content, less time. I don't quite know exactly what you do yet. And yeah. that's, that would be my only, uh, that'd be my only hesitation here. I would actually, I would not be afraid of maybe adding a little like subtitle to that to explain a little more about what you do. Cause if I go here initially, better content, less time podcast cheat sheet. So I would wonder, is this just about podcasting or is this about content in general? Um, that would so and actually, that, that kind of leads us to one of the questions I had for you with this would be your main call to action. What is your main call to action? What do you want people to do when they go to your website? I think that's a bit of a problem. There's so many things I want people to do. I think that, you know, optimally, someone that goes to my website says, Mark can help me launch and scale my podcast. I want to hire him either for consulting or for uh, services, right? I think it's, okay. it's, it, that would be the, that'd be the optimal result. Obviously, I want people to listen to my show and subscribe on YouTube and all that. But really, it's about, you know, my, you know, really, it's about connecting with someone, having a conversation about how I can help serve their need. So how do people pay you? And you don't have to tell me exactly, I guess, how we do this, but one, this is kind of a challenge that I have forced myself to go through and a lot of my students are doing. Your main call to action should be really be the quickest way to get somebody to pay you. Um, mm. The podcast cheat sheet is great, but I would view that as a secondary call to action. 
I, I don't know if that's the main thing. I, I would not be afraid about having people schedule a call with you, whether it's a free consultation or booking a, a strategy session, anything like that, that is a little more intentional to get to your bank account. I hate to say it like that, but you want to, I've found at least in my experience, you really want to highlight the quickest ways that people can, can pay you and, and sign up for a service. The other like content, that. like a podcast cheat sheet, like a free download, those things are awesome as other lead generators or things that are a little bit secondary. But I would be really clear about what you want somebody to do on your website. If it is to book a call, have book a call there, or book a free strategy session or, or sign up for a workshop or something like that. Um, that's probably what I would potentially have there. Better content, less time, a short info a little bit about what that means and then a strong like you know do this and then as people scroll down then there's a little more information about what you do and that's where you can add a podcast cheat sheet if that's one of the categories and, and kind of go from there yeah i'd love that how important do you think it is to have some sort of like a bio or about me on your home page like how important is that to the journey great point the most successful strategy i've seen that will work with everybody watching or listening is to definitely have an about page that is going to have more information about you the problem is you don't want to put your about page on your home page because then your home page just becomes a massive about page so the trick that i found to be super successful is to have what i like to call a founder's note or just a quick blurb about the the president, the CEO, the founder. Since this is a self-branded site like mine, Mark, it's a little easier because we can just say, you know, I'm Mark, this is what I do. Short little snippet about your story and why you do what you do. And then boom, a link to an about page that has more information. And then your about page is where you could get a little more detailed on your sales set, your excuse me, your skill set, your expertise, what you know, how you have all that stuff. But a little founder's note on your homepage is ideal for anyone, any industry, any category, even if it's a big business, something from the CEO there, so powerful. It adds so much more humanization to a brand. Love that. Love that. Uh, we are just, listen, Josh Hall has given us the goods, Josh. I don't want to uh, take it. So <laughs> I guess, is there anything else here? You're like, Mark, you got to fix this. Anything else you see on this homepage? Cause you're just giving me, this is so good. I know th this is also why my podcast never generally land under an hour because I got, so, I got so much stuff I want to get into. Um, <laughs> no, this looks really good. What I would say, if I could add anything to, I'm actually looking at your site on my end, just so I can zip through it a little faster. Um, I would say one thing, there's two things I would recommend. Well, actually you do have a, how it works. That's nice. That's really nice because you, I was going to say, you might want to clarify like what content means within like, you know, are you helping podcasting, YouTube videos, blog posts, social media, where, what kind of content are you helping create? I would definitely visualize that. It looks like you've got a strong start to that in the how, what is it? How it works section. How it works. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would definitely recommend doing is have a strong footer call to action section. This is one thing that most websites are lacking. So when you get to the bottom of the page, most websites just kind of fizzle out. Here is the perfect opportunity to bring in that main strong call to action. Again, for you, it might be to sign up or book a call. Uh, if you go to actually my homepage, because my, I've actually, I don't have one singular call to action on most of the pages as of now on my homepage. I do have a very clear call to action for all of my courses, my top product, which is my bundle. I have all of my top products in my bundle. And that's what I ideally want people to go to. So that's my main call to action that people know about. But my business is a little bit different than most. In your case, Mark, I would have a little section under like right above your actual footer that just has like a little maybe a zoom effect or a big section that just comes up and say, so are you ready like a challenge? Are you ready to build more content? I'm here mm. to, or to, to build better content and save time. I'm here for you, book a call or request a consultation, whatever that is. Um, I actually, <laughs> I wish I knew we were going to look at my site because I've got that on my to-do list. I'm actually creating a few different call to action sections for my website, depending on where they are in the journey. But um, like all entrepreneurs, sometimes we, our own websites are the, the least best reflection of us because we're, <laughs> we're busy building our business. But um, that's what I would do. I would have a really clear, like when you get, once you get to the end of that page, 
have a call to action. Don't let them leave. Don't let them go. A lot of people aren't going to sign up for a newsletter. We both have newsletters in our footer, which is fine. But the footer is often going to be on other pages. So have something in there that's like, hey, are you ready to go to the next level? I'm here to help. Or, or in your case, you ready to build better content, save more time, book here for free call or, or whatever it is, or uh, free download. That could be a great place for a lead gen or something like that as well. Amazing. Amazing. Josh, you are bringing the goods. Listen, y'all, you got to go to joshhall.co. You got to do it right now. It's, it, the website's br- beautiful. Obviously, Josh uh, has a great trunk to his tree filled <laughs> out there at, at, at joshhall.co. Um, and I tell you what, this has been extremely informative for me, Josh, and I'm sure it will all the after hours entrepreneurs out there. Um, I, I mean, honestly, we could go for another hour and <laughs> it's, it's just, it's so good. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Any, any closing thoughts, Josh, anything else you really want everyone to understand about you and about web design? Well, as far as, as what I do, I mean, I'm helping web design freelancers and web entrepreneurs. Uh, there is an interesting new kind of, um, I think expanding type of entrepreneur, which is a web design entrepreneur. These are people who have built websites, but they do what well, they want to do more than just build a website. They want to help clients with content, stuff like you're doing, branching outside of just web design. So I'm really passionate about helping web design freelancers and web entrepreneurs. So anyone interested can go to my website for sure. Um, I think the big thing though is one thing I've learned in my journey, going from a service provider to a course creator and a podcaster and YouTuber, um, I was trying to think of any sort of like closing final thought or just something really important I've learned. I've definitely learned that you really have to keep a pulse of your customers and Mm. your clients. I think this is something that is really important because it's often overlooked. Most people know that in the beginning and then they get busy with their business and they never reach back out to their customers again. Uh, That's a mistake. That's a big problem because you're going to identify changes. You're going to identify ways to innovate your business and do things differently. And a lot of people might think, well, that's great, Josh. Thanks for the vague advice. But I want to know, like, how do I actually do that? So to get tactile, the way you could do this is by doing any sort of like poll. If you want to figure out, you know, what are your customers main challenges? You could do it via email or Instagram polls or whatever it is. Uh, There's also something I I would love to encourage everyone to think about doing. This is going to require everyone to get out of their comfort zone. It's going to require them to do something they may not have ever done before, but it's extremely powerful. And I know that because it has helped boost my sales like wildfire recently. And that is to go live. If Mm. you go live on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, wherever you're at, or even if you just do it on certain platforms, it is extremely powerful. I'm all about webinars and training and masterclasses and things like that. But there is, there is something so powerful right now in this day and age of entrepreneurship, where if you can answer real time questions from your clients or soon to be clients and leads, it builds trust and authority even more than a podcast, I think. Um, I've actually been really, I've been really interested in this. And in fact, my business coach, James Ramko, who was the, the, um, the, the owner of the super fast business brand that I talked about earlier, he told me that he was like, consider going live more. It really builds trust. And I was like, Oh yeah, maybe I'll do that. Should have listened to him earlier. I did it. And then what was funny is like, I immediately saw the benefit and the ROI from that case in point last week at the time of recording this, I just launched the a new version of one of my courses as a part of the marketing strategy. I went live on YouTube for a little over an hour and answered questions about the topic. And I got two sales while I was live people were like, all right, I'm sold. I'm interested. And it was a $300 course. So during the the live call, I made 600 bucks before I even got done with that call. And then yes. after that, I had a lot more sales trickle in because they were in the funnel and then they were, they were, you know, even if they needed a night to, to think about it, they were interested. So, um, totally didn't think I was going to go here, but I, I think that's a really important challenge that I would encourage everyone to do. And just remember, if you're going to meet with a group of people or a client at a coffee shop or via zoom, why not do it at scale? Why not do it yeah. in bulk instead of answering, you know, a ton of questions for one person over the case of an hour, the you know course of an hour, answer a ton of questions for a hundred people, or even if it's 10 people, 10 people is awesome for a live call. That's, it doesn't need to be thousands of people on a live call. It could be a really small group and it can do a lot for your business. So that would be my challenge that, that I'm applying now that I've seen work really well for my business. Yeah. It's, it, it's, gosh, man, you just opened up a whole can of worms, but I will say that 
the, the, the point about when you go live and solving problems for people really quickly, giving them quick wins, immensely powerful. It's been, it's, it's, I mean, it's completely changing the way I do business um, on clubhouse clubhouse has just been a huge way for me to network, bring more people into my atmosphere, sign clients. It's been hugely powerful. So I, I agree live doing something live, having some sort. And that's why I said earlier, everyone needs to have some sort of show. I don't know what that looks like for you. It depends, but having yeah. a show is, is really important. I do think that's uh, a big shift in entrepreneurship right now is that idea yeah. of being open to, to more people and, and yeah, not less of one-on-one -on -one and more of one to many. Yeah. That I think is one of the most exciting things about living right now. It's that one to many ability. Josh, thanks so much for joining us and all the after hours entrepreneurs, brother. Dude, thanks for having me on. I feel like we just got started. Hopefully this was helpful for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching Mark Svant Media. Here we're gonna help you create a better content in less time and turn that attention into income. If you love this video, you're gonna love these videos here. Click the one, me and my team specially selected this just for you. Click the link, check out the video. I'll catch you here next time on Mark Svant Media. Peace.